Hello, class. Uh, this uh, lecture is uh, intended for Philosophy 110, Philosophy Through Film. So I told you I was going back and forth between uh, talking about Lao Tzu on the one hand, if for those of you who choose to write on Lao Tzu and The Wizard of Oz. And uh, the other couplet uh, was Nietzsche, the great philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. And we're coupling that with the um, Tim Burton version of Alice in Wonderland. I'd also like to tell you, if you absolutely cannot get a hold of these films, which I think it shouldn't be that hard, but if I prefer you to <clears throat> make the couplets as I intended, that is Nietzsche with Alice in Wonderland and Lao Tzu with The Wizard of Oz. But if you simply cannot get a hold of the, these films, uh, given your circumstances, you can choose any film you like to couple with Nietzsche and any film you like to couple with The Wizard of Oz. The, the assignments are exactly the same. It's just you try to choose a film that you think uh, lends itself to comparison. So, um, but, but try to get a hold of Alice in Wonderland if you can and uh, The Wizard of Oz. All right, so I'd like to um, return back to Nietzsche now. I found seven uh, principal themes in Nietzsche's philosophy. And these are themes that run throughout all the uh, assignments, all the um, reading assignments that I gave you from Nietzsche. I took certain things from the early um, period, uh, certain writings from his middle period, and um, a few things from the, the latter period of his life. <clears throat> but all of his writings um, are animated by seven principal themes. And I'll, uh, I'll tell you what these themes are, and perhaps you can look for them in the readings. The first one is called the will to power, Wille zur Macht in German, the will to power. So Nietzsche thinks that the most fundamental thing you can say about life is that life is the will to power. So if you want to understand any configuration, any phenomenon, uh, it can be a human body, it can be a relationship, it can be a political structure. You always want to look at the, the power structure. Okay, and so everything wants power. It wants to preserve its life, like we're trying to do now under this pandemic. But then once we feel we have life preserved, there's another force in life that wants to enhance itself, wants to become more. So the will to power is this life force that is driving all of life, anything living, the grass, the trees, the plants, all the animals, the humans, whatever is living is the will to power. It's the most basic factum of life, okay? Now, in life, there are two um, kinds of forces that make up a particular configuration that constitutes a particular life form. And Nietzsche talks about reactive forces on the one hand and active forces on the other. So these are two qualities of forces. There's only two qualities of force, active and reactive. So active forces don't need anything to react to. They just come out of themselves. Just as the word says, it's active. They emerge out of superfluous energy out of excess. Reactive forces, on the other hand, need something to react to, okay? Now, it's not that reactive forces are bad and active forces are good. Good and bad, for Nietzsche, um, are both made up of reactive and active forces. If something is good, if an organism is good, that means it's maintaining its life and it's growing, it's enhancing itself. Like we're trying to do, even during this pandemic, you're trying to educate yourself and we're continuing through this distance learning. We're engaging in enhancement, we're becoming more. And by the way, as a, it's not incidentally, uh, it's not an incidental thing, but I'll say it uh, since it jumps into my mind now, joy, is nothing other than the feeling of becoming more. 
whenever you feel a joyful moment, you feel yourself expanding, you feel yourself getting better at something. So there are active and reactive forces. When life is healthy and ascending and growing, then active forces are ruling and reactive forces are obeying. But there's another kind of organism that's dominated by reactive forces. When reactive forces are ruling and active forces are being separated from what they can do, then you have a reactive form of life. And the only way that this form of life can put itself up, it's like a parasite. The only way it can put itself up is by putting others down through exploitation. So it puts others down in order to put itself up. So whenever you see somebody always attacking, always putting others down, um, engaging in ad hominem, you know, uh, arguments to the person and not to the argument, that means it's a reactive form of life. So there's active life and reactive life. Active life means active forces are ruling, reactive forces are obeying. And this in makes possible growth because new active forces can challenge the active force that's ruling. And then you have a new active force and a new constellation and higher form of life and evolution of life. But in reactive types, where reactive forces are ruling and active forces are being separated from what they can do, there can be no growth. There can only be obedience. So Nietzsche talks about the will to power is life. All life wants power, but it depends on not all power is good power. Good power means that it's growing and it's enhancing and it doesn't need to put others down in order to put itself up. But bad will to power is reactive life, where reactive forces are ruling and active forces are being separated from what they can do. So this relates to the film because Alice is living in Victorian England, where the values that are predominant in her world are reactive forces. There's a morality of good and evil, where, and where evil is considered anything that transcends or transgresses the morals and the mores of the times. So this morality of good and evil is rooted in reactive life. It's rooted in a negation of life. But there's also something inside of Alice, which is represented by the White Queen, where she was much more connected to when she was young. And that's beyond good and evil. Nietzsche calls that the morality of good and bad. So there's the morality of good and bad, which is active life, and then the morality of good and evil, which is reactive life. And the Red Queen could be seen as an embodiment of reactive will to power, which arises out of a negation of life. And the White Queen can represent for us active life. So there's good and bad and good and evil. Nietzsche embraces good and bad and launches a critique of the morality of good and evil. So one of the major themes in all of Nietzsche's philosophy is called the will to power. All life is the will to power, but it depends on what kind of power it is. Is it reactive power where it puts others down in order to put itself up? Where it induces fear instead of, instead of love? where it arises out of negation of life rather than affirmation of life, like the Red Queen? Or, on the other hand, is it active life? Life that is over full and overflowing. It wants to foster all life because it has more and enough to give, more than enough to give. So there's a scene, for example, in the film where the Mad Hatter is carrying Alice. She's very small at that moment. You might want to think about how, you know, why in the film, sometimes Alice is much too small and sometimes she's way too big. You could think about that in light of Nietzsche too, but we'll talk about that another time. 
So at this point, she's very small and she's on the, she's being carried by the Mad Hatter and they're walking. And the issue comes up about slaying the Jabberwacky. And she has, at this point, has not the courage to slay the Jabberwacky. And so she says, I don't slay, I couldn't slay, I, I, I'm not gonna slay anything. And the Mad Hatter, who's usually well disposed towards Alice, he's very upset about this. He takes her off his shoulder, puts her down, you don't slay. And then he goes off in this diatribe about how important it is to slay the Jabberwacky. He said, you know, you've lost something, something right here. And he takes his finger and he touches her guts. What are the guts? That's a metaphor for courage, existential courage. When you say somebody doesn't have guts to do something. You've lost something. You've lost your muchness, your muchiness. So that's called a neologism. Somebody came up with that, either Tim Burton or the writers. Muchiness. Perhaps it's in Lewis Carroll. I, I have to check. But it's a, it's a new word, muchiness. But think about that, muchiness. Muchiness means the will to power, excess. Much is great, excess. You've lost this existential courage that you used to have when you were young. Now you've complied to the morality of good and evil. And now you have assumed this reactive form of life. So now you can't slay. There's nothing active in your life to slay. You've lost your will to power, or you've transformed your will to power into a reactive form of the will to power. So that's one major theme in all of Nietzsche's thought. It takes on various permutations in all of his writings. Life is the will to power. If you want to understand anything, whether it's a historical moment, uh, a situation, a phenomenon, um, it can be anything. Look at the power structure and you'll understand that phenomenon much better. So another theme that also um, supports the most overarching theme is what I call the doctrine of the love of life, the affirmation of life. In addition to the will to power, Nietzsche has this idea of resentment. Now, when he speaks of resentment, of course, words take on meaning in different contexts, but the deeper meaning of, of the word resentment in Nietzsche's philosophy, raka in German is the word. It has three meanings. It means negation, aversion, a negation, aversion, and um, devaluation. It has three meanings in German. So resentment is negation, aversion, and devaluation. Of what? Of life itself. Okay, so now, so he's not thinking about it in a psychological way. Like some people feel resentment, they're peevish, they, they feel jealousy or envy, and they like to put others down in order to put themselves up. That's part of it. But the deeper meaning is there's this negation, aversion, and devaluation at, of life at the heart of this person or organism or whatever it is. And because it's unable to say yes to life as, it, as life truly is, how is life truly? It passes, everything passes. And so death and life are intimately connected. Everything passes. And also life involves suffering and inexplicable things, like things that you just can't explain. There's the enigmatic, the horrible, the terrible, suffering, death. All these parts are part of life. There's no getting around it. Where there's life, there's all these things. So out of an inability to say yes to life because of those negative qualities, Nietzsche thinks that Western philosophy, now this is a radical thesis and I'm not asking you to accept it. I'm just telling you what he thinks. He thinks that ever since ancient Greece until now, until his day and continuing on past his day, 
for the most part, not everybody at all times and not all situations, not the Renaissance, not early Greek before the classical period. Um, there are periods that are not part of this and there are individuals who are not part of this either. But for the most part, the whole history of philosophy, the whole history of Western theology, ever since the times of Plato until now, have been dominated, have been dominated by this reactive form of the will to power, what he calls resentment, this negation, devaluation, and aversion to life itself. So out of an inability to say yes to life, we create these phantasms, these fictions that are not real, that are beyond life. And we use those to make value judgments about life. So we make a metaphysical reality, a suprasensuous. And we set that above the sensuous world of becoming. And so all the qualities of life become qualities of mere appearance. And all the qualities of this meta, meta means beyond in Greek, metaphysical, beyond the physical, like pure being, for example, or pure spirit. The very word pure means if I say pure spirit, that means there's nothing contaminating it. It's pure. But what contaminates spirit if you say poor spirit? The body, matter. The very word pure spirit is a negation of life itself, which is embodied. So for Nietzsche, life is always incarnate. It's always embodied. Everything spiritual has a body. Every body is something spiritual. So to create this metaphysical world and set it above life, the suprasensuous world, is already to denigrate life because there's a value judgment being made. The metaphysical is greater and better than the physical. So this he calls resentment against life itself, a negation, an aversion, and a devaluation of life. And Nietzsche is trying to develop a philosophy of the love of life. All these seven themes I'm going over with you right now are Nietzsche's way of composing this philosophy of the love of life, the doctrine of the love of life. This is what attracts me to Nietzsche's philosophy because I'd like to be one of those persons that say yes to life. It's not just a matter of saying, I love life, and, or wearing t-shirts and life is good. It, you can say that all you want, wear all the t-shirts you want. It matters about the values that you embrace. So here's the radical part of Nietzsche's philosophy. The highest values then of Western theology and Western philosophy, for the most part, not all interpretations, have arisen out of resentment towards life. And insofar as they arise out of resentment, they embody this resentment. So if we don't revaluate our values, if we don't ask, does this value that I embrace, does it arise out of affirmation of life or negation of life? If we don't revaluate our values, then we inadvertently participate in this conspiracy against life itself without even knowing it. Have you ever heard the expression, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I used to hear that when I was a boy. Well, one could have the best intentions in the world, but inadvertently, one could be generating a set of values that arise out of negation of life itself. So this is the radical part of Nietzsche's philosophy, that the very ground, the very generative force that gave rise to our, our so-called highest values have arisen out of resentment towards life and therefore embody a negation of life itself. So he calls for a revaluation of values. He wants, he wants us to think about the origin of our values. Does it arise out of affirmation or does it arise out of negation of life? Examples would be like truth as under, understood as unchanging being. That's one of the major ideas of truth that dominates Western philosophy. But nobody's seen anything unchanging ever. It's impossible. You can't even think something unchanging. 
because your thoughts are constantly changing. So no one can even conceive or perceive anything unchanging. And yet this becomes the very definition of truth. So where did it come from, this phantasmagoria of truth understood as unchanging being? It comes out of resentment towards life. Or another one, being, something identical with itself. There's nothing that remains unchanging. So where did this idea come from? That there's such a thing as being that's identical with itself and it's unchanging. Resentment. And one could go through all the major ideas of Western theology and Western philosophy, for the most part, not all, and find that the ground of these values is resentment. That's a very radical thesis. I'm not asking you to accept it. I'm just asking you to try to understand Nietzsche's point. I mean, one idea is, and now I, I'm tiptoeing around on religious ground, but the emphasis on the next life in Christianity or in Islam or any religion that puts the accent on the next life as a better life than this life. Nietzsche would think, Nietzsche thinks that that whole notion of the afterlife being a better place than this life has arisen out of resentment towards this life. So we create a world where there's no suffering, no death, and we believe it even though we can't, we make that leap of faith. Now, of course, the man or woman of faith could say, ye of little faith. And so Nietzsche would say, fine, but I'm using my reason and I'm not ready to throw reason to the wind. And this is what I think. I think if you create another world that's better than this world and you live for that world, then you're denigrating this life. And by the way, he also thinks that Jesus never emphasized the next world. I come to give you life and life more abundantly, for example, in the gospel according to John. Nietzsche thinks that he, he came to teach us how to live this life. So that's called resentment. Another idea uh, that's related to resentment is a doctrine um, well, we've talked about this, so I'll just touch on it here. The spiritualization of animality. So in modern philosophy, there's this idea that human beings are not animals. It's not as so predominant in ancient philosophy as it is in modern times. And so the assumption is that, of course, there are animals. We see them in the zoo and we live with our dogs and cats and, and there are these wild animals all over the place. And then there are humans. And of course, Nietzsche knows humans are different from the other animals. But are we animals at all? Are we not animals at all? Well, modern philosophy says, no, we're not. This body that we have indeed is our animality. We have five senses like the animals, locomotion, desires, and appetites, and all these things like the other animals. But that's not who we are. Who are we then? We are pure spirit. We're pure ego. We're thinking things, as Descartes says, for example, the father of modern philosophy. So I'm not an animal. In fact, do you ever watch a movie and the worst thing anyone could say about anyone is he's an animal? And notice in the film, Alice in Wonderland, the white, the red queen, is cruel towards animals. That's why I had you read that first chapter of Vanessa Lem's book. I gave, I gave a whole little talk on that. So what Nietzsche is talking about is, of course, of course uh, human beings are animals. I mean, just look in the mirror. When you go to the doctor, I mean, um, this whole pandemic couldn't exist unless humans were animals. In fact, they just found tigers had the coronavirus. And, but so, of course, we're different from the other animals, and that becomes a question then of how we're different. And so what Nietzsche calls for is a spiritualization of animality. 
instead of trying to negate whatever animality we have. See, that's the problem of Alice in Victorian England. Any concession to human animality was considered evil and taboo. And so dancing and sex and laughter, all those Dionysian activities that are so closely associated with animality were considered evil. Any transgression of that was considered evil. So Nietzsche is calling for a spiritualization of animality, to embrace our animality and to spiritualize it. Another theme that's closely, all these themes, by the way, are all intimately connected and they all serve the one major theme that I told you in, in Nietzsche is called doctrine of the love of life. There's this idea of eternal return. So what is the eternal return? Well, the eternal return is Nietzsche's idea of the being of becoming. Being and becoming are united. So once we overcome this metaphysical dualism where we put being as reality and we separate it from becoming and then becoming below that, this metaphysical dualism I told you that dominates Western philosophy. Once you overcome metaphysical dualism, then these dualistic things are united. You have the unity of opposites. Well, when, two, when being and becoming come together, you have the being of becoming. Nietzsche calls that the eternal return. So what is the eternal return? Well, the eternal return is the, the giant cycle of becoming. And we're part of that, cycle, that giant cycle of becoming. Time is a circle. And so we're born a particular person with particular parents living a particular life. Everything is very unique and individualized. And then we die. And then there's this long night of nothingness. And then we're born again. But it's not reincarnation. You're not born into another body. It's not heaven or hell or purgatory or limbo or any of those places. It's you again with the same parents, the same time, the same life. There was a movie, Groundhog's Day, that was playing with this idea. So energy is finite and time is infinite, Nietzsche thought. So if time is infinite and energy is finite, then all this energy has all the time in the world to reproduce the configurations that it, that it assumes. And so everything just keeps going around in a circle because of the eternal return. And we're part of that. Now, is it true? Well, Nietzsche did try to prove it being true, mostly based on the concept of time being infinite and energy being finite, but he never published those. He saw it more as a transfiguring idea that if you believe it to be true, then it would transfigure you. It would eliminate all the resentment. It would transform your will to power into affirmative will to power. It would move you from slave morality, the red queen, to master morality, the white queen. The first time he communicates this idea is in a book called The Gay Science, where he says, what if some day or night a demon were to steal into your loneliest loneliness and say unto you, this life as you live it, you will live it again and again, and there will be nothing new in it, and the eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down again and again, and you with it, step, uh, speck of dust. Would you not na fall to the ground and gnash your teeth and, and, and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you ever experienced a tremendous moment when you have, would have said, you are a God, and never have I heard anything more divine? So 
if you ask yourself, what, what would what would I think if someone told me that this life I'm living, I would have to live over and over again? How would you feel about that? Well, if you think that's the most horrible idea in the world, then that means you're not very well disposed towards your own life and to life itself. But if you think, well, yeah, this was a pretty good life, actually. I've turned my life into a work of art. I've filled it with these tremendous moments. And I get to do that all over again. Of course, I've suffered. I've been humiliated. You know, I've been lonely. I've doubted myself, all those things. But I like who I am and I like this life. Yeah, if that was life, well then once more. Da capo, as they say in music. Let's do it again. Think about da capo, when you people who have studied music and know that. It means you start again and play the whole thing again. Why would a musician, a composer, have you play the same thing again? Because it's beautiful, that's why. And you want to hear it again. So was that life? Well then, once more. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. So Nietzsche puts this idea out as an antithesis to all these values that put the metaphysical above the physical. Any, what this idea would do, if you believed it to be true, you don't have to think it's actually true and prove it. You just have to believe it to be true. If you believe it to be true, it, it serves to burn out any resentment and it turns you into a lover of life. It, think about it. If, if this were to be true, how would you change your life? What would you do differently? Would you do half-hearted things like you did before? Or would you kill time doing these little stupid things? Because everything you do, you'd be inscribing it into eternity. So you'd turn your life into a work of art. So he sets this as a counter ideal to the metaphysical ideal that has dominated Western philosophy. And the function of this would be to cultivate the, the love of life. So that's called the eternal return, the doctrine of the eternal return. And the way I, I would relate it to the, the film, you know, when you, watch, when, when you watch the movie, Alice does the same thing all over again. And when, when, I mean, think about um, the very writing of, of fiction. When Lewis Carroll wrote Alice in Wonderland and he gave it as a gift to somebody he was very fond of, her name was Alice, a young girl. Every time she reads it, she does the same, Alice does the same thing over and over again. And she does it over and over again because it's, it's, it's worth reading again. She does it again and again and again because it's inherently beautiful and worthwhile. And when you watch the movie, it's going to be the same thing over and over again. So there is that repetition in the very structure of literature, of fiction, and of film. There may be other ways you could connect the eternal return with um, the, with, with the film, but that's just something that jumped into my mind today. Another uh, theme is what Nietzsche calls the Ubermensch, and usually they translate that as overman, but Mensch in German means human. So I think probably when I, when I write on Nietzsche, I translate Ubermensch into overhuman. So as opposed to thinking of human beings as over animal, all the definitions of humans are what we have that animals don't have. Nietzsche has this idea of the ubermensch, the over human. And this too is a very radical idea. It's very Nietzschean. It, it's in, in no other philosopher that I know of. The ubermensch is the somebody who's overcome metaphysical dualism. So like Alice becomes an ubermensch at the end of the film, because she slays the Jabberwocky. The Jabberwocky could be interpreted as metaphysical dualism. 
the Ubermensch is somebody who's overcome, whose will to power is dominated by active force. Uh, the Ubermensch is the origin of the values of the Ubermensch are not resentment, but gratitude towards life. Uh, the opposite of resentment. The Ubermensch is one who embraces master morality rather than slave morality, like the white queen. And the Ubermensch is one who embraces his or her own animality and spiritualizes that animality. So the, Nietzsche thinks that human beings are not the end result, the, the pinnacle of creation, as it's taught in Western theology and, and Western philosophy, that between the non-human animal and the ubermensch is the human. So the human is only a stage on the way towards the ubermensch. The ubermensch, he says, is the meaning of the earth. The ubermensch will be one who, instead of desecrating the earth as we're doing now, and now we're seeing the results of it with climate change, the ubermensch is one who is faithful to the earth. Instead of being faithful to otherworldly ideals, the Ubermensch is faithful to the earth. So the Ubermensch is the one who lives in accordance with the doctrine of the eternal return. And the seventh uh, theme that you may want to look for when you're reading Nietzsche is one that pertains directly to the film Alice in Wonderland. It's called Become Who You Are. The subtitle of Nietzsche's autobiography, his autobiography he titles Ecce Homo, which means Behold the Man. And it's a philosophical um, autobiography. And the, the, the subtitle of that book is How One Becomes What One Is. And that's the very theme of Alice in Wonderland. Alice's whole life of project the whole film is about how she becomes Alice. Remember at the beginning of the film, there's this controversy, is this the right Alice? And, and Ypsilon says, no, not hardly. And then she keeps going back to Ypsilon. And finally, when she's ready to, when she musters up the courage to slay the Jabberwocky, then he says, yes, now you're Alice. So she has to muster up the courage, which is represented by the vault Vulpal sword, that means existential courage, to become who she is. Becoming, which is, becoming who you are is sort of a paradox, right? When you think about it logically, it doesn't make any sense. How can you become who you already are? If I am a certain person, how can I become that person? Well, the only way I make sense of it is this doctrine, this idea of potentiality and actuality. There are certain potentialities in all of us. And some of these potentialities are potentialities of greatness. And one will either transform those potentialities into actualities or not. If you are able to transform those potentialities into actualities, then you become a great person. Now, being a great person doesn't necessarily mean you become like Jesse Owens or uh, Mozart or Pablo Picasso or Arturo Sandoval, my favorite you know, musician. I mean, those are great people and great. They, they became great. They became who they are. But one could become a great mother, a great gardener, a great lover. You know, there are all kinds of forms that greatness takes. A great nurse. It takes on a plurality of forms. But one either blossoms or not. And it could be, and Nietzsche in fact says that it is, that there are forces that suck the very lifeblood out of us without us even knowing it. And these forces are values that have arisen out of resentment towards life. So it could be that the very values that we embrace that we consider good are like little aphids that are sucking the life blood out of 
the bud of a rose bush and the roses never blossom. So animals usually have no problem, wild animals, if as long as their habitat is not destroyed and, and the, there's a balance in the ecosystem, they usually blossom and everything is fine. But humans are much fragile, are fragile animals. And so if we embrace a set of values that sucks our life blood out of us, then we wither on the vine, like those buds that never blossom. So the whole task of life is becoming who you are. And Alice becomes who she is, but in order to do that, she has to slay the Jabberwacky. She has to twist free of anything that's holding her back from becoming who she is. And that could be the very values that are being taught to her by the very world that she lives in, by her mother, by everyone. She has to muster up the courage to go it alone. I mean, watch that battle between Alice and the Jabberwacky and listen very carefully to what they say to each other. For example, when she, her first mortal, her first blow to the Jabberwacky, she cuts off his tongue, which is language, right? That's where the thou shalt come from, language. She cuts off his tongue. But before that, he says, we meet again, my old enemy. And she says, I haven't met you before. He says, not you, insignificant bearer. So what could that mean? It's not you, Alice, that I'm meeting again. It's the Volpo sword, the courage to fight the Jabberwacky. And that's been going on since ancient times. It's always been conformity versus greatness. And the great ones never conform. They set the standard. And then later on, people conform to theirs. So becoming who you are is the very task of life. The other thing that um, you might find in Nietzsche is becoming who you are is not a cognitive process for Nietzsche. There's an unconscious existential imperative that tells us become who you are. It speaks to us silently. And, it, and we feel guilty for not being who we are. There's only one kind of guilt for Nietzsche, and that's the guilt of not becoming who you are, of not being yourself. So this existential imperative is telling us, become who you are. And our cognitive things, part of us is saying, who are you? Know thyself. That's coming from the upper part of our consciousness. But there's something in our deep, deeply embedded in our unconscious, in our bodies, in our animality, that drives us in a certain direction. And we don't even know why we're moving in that direction. We only know that when I do what I, whatever it is that gravitates me towards who I am, I feel powerful, I feel free. I'm developing these capacities that will one day tell me this you can do, this you alone can do. So there's this artistry of the instincts of our bodies that is driving us. I like to use the metaphor of gravitation. We gravitate towards our destiny. And consciousness, know thyself, could be the formula for ruin because it will lead us. Consciousness for Nietzsche is only the surface of the iceberg. Nietzsche knew this before Freud. Freud used that as a metaphor. And now people use that, the tip of the iceberg. You know, the, the tip of the iceberg is very small, but then beneath it is this whole, whole huge iceberg, right? So consciousness is the tip of the iceberg. There's a deeper reality of our being, it's unconscious. And then there's an existential imperative driving us and moving us, gravitating us towards our identity. But for that, you need courage. You need the vocal sword. So these are the seven principal themes of Nietzsche. They all affirm the one central theme, which is the doctrine of the love of life the will to power, resentment, master and slave morality, eternal return, the ubermensch, the overhuman, the spiritualization of animality, and becoming who you are. So look for those themes in all of the writings, 
and see if you can see those themes being exemplified in this very allegorical film, Alice in Wonderland. Okay, wash your hands.